Gracious Heavenly Father, this evening again, we are very thankful for life, for health, for so many answers to prayer, prayers that we said, as well as prayers that we never even thought of. Thank you that you have given us another opportunity this evening to gather around your word. We come with hearts that are, should be teachable. Help us, Lord, that we would want to listen carefully and to receive everything with the joy and the, the great importance that you are giving it to us. I pray also for those that are still trying to join the group and help us, Lord, that after this evening we would have known we had spent time with you. In the name of Jesus, we ask and we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, um, memory verses begin with John 15, 5 in, on page 18. I am the vine, ye are the branches, he that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, ye can do nothing. Very good. John 5, 30, I can of mine own self do nothing. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just. Because I do not seek to do my own will, I, I do not seek my, I seek not mine own will, but the will of the Father which has sent me. There was something that wasn't feeling well there for sure. Next one is Romans 5.20 out of page 26 in your books. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound. But where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. Praise God. Mind transplant time from Philippians 2, 5 through 8. And again, we need to sign that release to say the surgeon has our authorization to do the surgery, right? So let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation. And took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Amen. Thank you for, thank, thank God, thank Jesus for his very humble heart that didn't, Look at himself, but looked at our need. Romans 6.23 <clears throat> from chapter 5 on page 64 of your books. For the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. From chapter 6, page 77, Jeremiah 29, 11. For I know the thoughts of that I think toward you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. <clears throat> the next one is directly from the Bible, Galatians 5, 6. For in Jesus Christ, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision availeth anything, but faith which worketh by love. Very good. And the definition of faith, therefore, is faith is the expecting the word of God to do what it says and the depending upon that word only to do what it says. Yes. Now we go into the series for the sanctuary and we begin with Exodus 25, 8 and let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. Psalm 77, 13. Thy way, O God, is in the sanctuary. Who is so great a God as our God? First John 1, 9. What picture do you have in your minds when we say First John 1, 9? Any picture? You see the altar of sacrifice? And you see the lever? Good. 
Then <laughs> let's repeat it. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Amen. Next one comes from Psalms 85, 10. Begins with mercy. Mercy and truth are met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed each other. Psalms 85, 10. Next one comes from Psalms, again, 103, verse 12. And it is pretty much what Jesus did at the cross, right? As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. That's as far as he has put them. If we confess our sins, that's exactly what he does. In other verses, it tells us that he casts our sins behind his back. He doesn't have them in front. He doesn't keep a, a record of them and is checking them every time. Oh, that's the third time she's doing that. Oh, this is 1,995th time for her, for her on that. No, he casts them behind his back. And yet in another verse in the Bible, it says that he casts our sins in the depths of the sea. And there are some very deep depths there for sure. All right, Galatians 2.20 is the present one. <clears throat> and we are about to finish chapter 10. So you know that there are others in the offing. So Galatians 2.20, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. <clears throat> Very good. Continue to review that. And actually tonight uh, at the end, I think I will announce the next one so you can start reviewing it for yourselves. It's a beautiful promise of peace, by the way, just as, a, as an early deposit. So we left off, left off on page 131 of the book last time. Um, in order to confirm and review and affirm some points, I would like us to go back a little bit to 129 to that very beautiful concept of atonement. Now, we studied atonement when we did the, the sanctuary. Our whole session was just on that, right? And we studied what it meant, and we studied how it was fulfilled, and we studied what different, different kinds of uh, meanings the word atonement has. And here is one of them in page 129. We studied that as well at that time. At one meant. At one minute. Now, atonement in the sense of what was done in the sanctuary. Remember, there was a lot of cleaning and cleansing, right? It meant cleansing. But at one minute means being together in one, in perfect unity. And for that, and I'm going to give you a little hint and see if, if this has already stuck somewhere in your minds. If I told you Matthew 1, would you be able to find two verses there that tells us about atonement and about adonement? Open your Bibles and look it up. Matthew 1, there are two verses in there. Matthew 1. Okay. <clears throat> you can always open up your, your uh, mic and... Tell me what you found. Matthew 1, somewhere in there. There's a verse that speaks about cleansing from sin. And then there's another one that speaks about being one, at one minute, a unit, unit in unity. Anyone? More towards the end. What was the question again? I'm sorry. The question is, where in Matthew 1 do you find two verses 
one that speaks about cleansing from sin and the other one that speaks about unit or uh, uni unity with man. Anybody? Is the unity verse 17? Uh, no. Okay. It isn't, but keep looking, keep going. It's closer okay. to the end. Verse 23. Verse 23. Verse 23. Yes. Remember, remember Emmanuel? God yeah. with us. That's the unity. God That's the at one minute. And where is the other one? I'm telling you, it's before that. <laughs> Before 23. Is it verse 21? Yes, ma'am. Are you asking me a question or giving me an answer? Well, I'm just, I'm. <laughs> yes. The two of them are names of Jesus, right? Names for the baby. Thou shalt call his name Jesus, mm -hmm. for he shall save Thank his you. people from their sin. That's cleansing. That's taking them away as far as the east is from the west. And verse 23, and his name shall be Emmanuel, which translated is God with us. Add one meant. Let's look at page 129 in your books. That section there about add one meant. Again, add means in the position of one, well, that means perfectly united or of the same kind, right? He became of our same kind, right? And meant is a suffix that means in a state of. The paragraph right after that, go ahead and read it aloud with me. Everybody is muted. And so say, so you put these words together and you have atonement. You have man. And God in the position of perfect unity at that point, at that time, in a state of total oneness. And therefore, we have such a high priest who became we, one. And therefore, as that law of God comes to me and it says, I demand that life, Jesus Christ can stand in my stead. Why? Because he is I. He is you. Very good. All right. We had progressed from that onto page 130, where we found our memory verse and quite a commentary on it. So let's repeat again. What is the libro? Harold in the loud cry. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. Page 130. Thanks for asking, Alfie. All right. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless. I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. At the bottom of 130, then let's begin the reading to merge right in. Even though in Jesus I am dead, I am buried, I'm still breathing. My heart is still pumping. I still have a life to live. But if I died with Jesus because he took upon him my sinful life, and in that stead there is a perfect life that stands before God, then I have a perfect life. I have a perfect life. And if that law is met and satisfied, that life has to be not just up until I got baptized, but a perfect life, which is my life from the day I was born to the end. And by God's grace, there never will be any end. Jesus Christ became we. What we see in the scriptures 2,000 years ago is your life. It's my life. Let's turn then now and read Hebrews 5, 7 to 9. Please read right along. Who in the days of his flesh, whose flesh? My flesh, because he became we, right? He became I, you. Who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with strong crying and tears unto him that was able to save him from death, 
and was heard, and in that he feared, though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. What was his experience? Do you think that after baptism, life's going to be easy because now he liveth in me? It is true he liveth in me, right? I, I, I'm not saying it isn't, right? No. He had to offer up prayers and supplications with strong cryings and tears unto whom? Unto him that was able to save him from death. Now, is that not a savior in my experience? He could not even save himself. He had to rely upon the Father to save him. Are you ever tempted to think that God doesn't hear your prayers? Well, he heard the prayers of Jesus. And Jesus is we. Though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. What is that? Sanctification. Being made perfect. So let's not think about sanctification as a study in which you reach a point and then you get a diploma. No. Every one of the experiences that we go through. I was talking to some of the ones that, that uh, got in first before the time for the meeting tonight about taxes today. And I'm telling you, everyone, every experience as secular as taxes could ever be. And yet the power of God is there as well. It's everything, every step of our lives, every circumstance circumstance in our lives, every situation that we encounter, whether we know it's coming or whether it just appears all of a sudden in front of us, that is another opportunity for sanctification, for being made perfect, just like it was with Jesus. This is li this life of Jesus Christ was a life of sanctification, and that life was our life. So, If I have accepted this sacrifice of Jesus for my sins that are past, likewise, this experience will be mine. We've read the scriptures before. Hebrews 5, 1 and 2. Let's read together. For every high priest taken from among men is ordained for men in things pertaining to God, that he, that he may offer both gifts and sacrifices for sins who can have compassion on the ignorant and on them that are out of the way, or that he himself also is compassed with infirmity. This is a description of our high priest. He is encompassed with infirmity. Are you, are we encompassed with infirmities? And do we know what the word infirmity means? It means weaknesses, illnesses, despairing, suffering, all of that. What we meet from day to day here on this side of heaven, right? Chapter 415 of Hebrews says this, For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. He is touched with the feelings of our infirmities. And how can he be touched with the feelings of our infirmities? How can he be touched except he is in the same position, in the same experience? And how can he feel the infirmities except he is as I am, where I am? Verse 16 says, Let us therefore. Come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. I want to point out a couple of words there. Any guess as to which is the first one I'm going to point to? Boldly? That's the second. <laughs> That's the second? Very good guess. <laughs> You're reading my mind ahead. Which one do you think? Let. Let us. 
I have therefore in my head. Oh, okay. <laughs> but thank you for playing. See what's in my mind, right? <laughs> yes, therefore. Mercy. Yes, Raina. Oh, I thought mercy. Mercy, okay. Mercy. Oh, I want to begin before mercy there, where it says therefore. Therefore, therefore yes. is a word that is very easy to slide right over. Because, I mean, what does therefore mean? You know, it's not like it has great significance about justification or sanctification or this or the other, but it does. But it does. Exactly. It's based on whatever came before. Based on what we just said, which was what? Verse 15, right? Let's read it again on page 131. Let's see again what, what is this the foundation of. Again, verse 15 says, For we do not have a priest, a high priest, which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are yet without sin. Therefore, because he feels our infirmities, because he is touched with everything that we are touched, because he was tempted in all points like as we are, but without sin. That is the reason why verse 16 is true. And what a be beautiful thing. Now comes the next word, boldly. We can come boldly. We don't have to apply. We don't have to send in the application and wait. You know, like when you are waiting for a visa or anything like that. You don't have to get so many signatures or recommendations or anything. Boldly. I always get in my mind the picture of a little kid just coming into the parent's bedroom. Does he have to knock? Does he have to say, hello, anybody there? Can I come in? He just barges in, oh, mommy, oh, mommy, and just, just comes right in. And he says, therefore, come boldly before the throne of grace. When you need mercy, when you need help in time of need, of need just come. Come in. There is grace. There is mercy. There is help. There is everything that you need. That is the privilege of prayer. And it's because Jesus feels and is touched with our infirmities. And because Jesus is um, was tempted in all points like as we are. And because he is without sin. Because of that, we have the free 24-7 privilege of approaching the throne of of the universe boldly, boldly before God. Do we owe anything to Jesus? The more we study, the more we learn, the many more things we find that we owe to him. Isn't that so? So let's continue. Nobody, a comment. Yes. Nobody can do, the, can do that into the throne of Queen of England. <laughs> No, you can't run. You couldn't do that into the White House either. <laughs> well, come White House, nobody. <laughs> but the son of President Lincoln, I believe, he ran in with a young man he found outside that nobody mm. will talk to him, an army. And he ran boldly with a guy and he didn't get killed because now he was with the yes. son of the president. Yes, that is correct. Yes. Jesus opened up the throne room of the universe to each one of us. To come in boldly. Have you sinned? This price has been paid. Believe it. But when laying hold of the reality that Jesus stands in your stead, there's a greater reality. Are you tempted? Then Jesus is praying with strong crying and tears unto him that can save we from death. Friends, we know these are of ages where Jesus says, I know your tears. I also have wept. And by the way, that is on page 53 of this book. We read it before. If we have time at the end, we will read it too. He's wept. He knows your tears. Can you make a connection there? He wept your tears. Strong crying and tears unto God. And he is heard and he overcomes and Satan has nothing in him. And he was we. Are you reviled, insulted, in other words? Jesus reviled not again. Do you suffer? 
Jesus did not threaten. And he was we. Jesus' life was our life, your life, my life. When I am tempted to feel that I cannot, in Jesus, I can. And I already have. Amen. Will you believe this? Will you believe that when you see the sinfulness of your life, that there is for you a perfect life? From this day henceforth, you can slot right straight into that life and live it? Yes, you can. But sanctification involves very much a process of learning to believe that. See, the process of sanctification is not so much what we're going to have to do and accomplish. It's how we're going to learn to believe that it is being done in us. That God is ready to do it and let him do it, right? And to believe that means to let it be your life. Do you ever get provoked? And as that provocation's there, you feel your blood start to boil and your flesh wants to rise up and you just want to lash out? Well, plead with God that he will give you the Holy Spirit to take of Jesus and show him to you. To show you Jesus standing before Caiaphas and the Sanhedrin, Sanhedrin, standing before Pilate and Herod. The Zara of Ages, page 710 says, Never was a criminal treated in so inhuman a manner as was the Son of God. We've heard stories of what the prisoners of war in the world wars suffered, and even more recent stories that have come through from Iraq and Afghanistan, and now more recently, even yet, from Ukraine, right? Never was anyone treated as inhuman as was Jesus. He copped worse than anyone ever has. And when he was reviled, he reviled them not. He was as a sheep to the slaughter and was we. Are you tempted to get worked up? Let your mind focus on Jesus. And when you see Jesus standing firm, meekly bearing it all, friends, believe that he did it as you. And that it is a manifestation of what he has already done for you in your life. Take it, if you will, like a prophecy of your own life. That if you follow on to know your Lord, you will stand there unmoved. Whatever it is that we read of Jesus Christ in his word, what we see 2,000 years ago, friends, is a life of he who became we. We need to see that life. We need to see the Holy Spirit to take off Jesus and show him to us. The Zara of Ages, page 805 says, the impartation of the Spirit is the impartation of the life of Christ. Page 133. We are so prone to read life as being the life forces, as the electrical electrical currents, not the living practical reality, but the Holy Spirit imparts to us the living practical life of Jesus Christ. We want the outpouring of the latter rain, don't we? Then we want his life. And if his life was my life, then the desire of ages, page 668, really starts to make sense. If we consent, let's read together. He will so identify himself with our thoughts and aims, so blend our hearts and minds into conformity to his will, then that when obeying him, we shall be but carrying out our own impulses. Do we believe that? That Jesus can imprint his character in us so fully that when we are going, choosing, deciding, speaking, responding, acting or reacting, what we will be doing is exactly what he would do. Just naturally, as naturally as it is to get upset or get angry 
or threaten back or insult back as easy and automatically as that comes to every one of us, it can also be the life of Jesus imparted to us and we will be doing exactly what Jesus would have done instead. It is a reality, not just a theory, not just words. It will be natural. It has to be natural because I have sunk my life in the life of Jesus Christ. And as his heart responded to the will of God, likewise, mine will, because his heart was our heart. What must I do to be saved? That was the question. Yes, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Believe in this precious at one minute. We don't need to get confused as so many people do over this word. Just believe. Only believe, friends. Only believe the right thing and it will work righteousness. It is right doing by faith. Here comes another question. Can you think of a text that you know by heart that speaks about right doing by faith? Let me see if I can read lips. It's found in Galatians. Uh, Galatians 5 6. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> Galatians 5 6, right? Yeah. Circumcision doesn't avail anything. Uncircumcision either, but faith that works. That's faith. right doing, right? Faith that works by love. Faith that produces right doing by love. Yes, that's exactly what righteousness by faith is. Continuing there, believe that the life which Jesus lived was my life, your life. Only as we believe that can we understand the testimony of Minneapolis. It is a gift and God can come as soon as he pleases. We will be ready if we will just let him live out his life within us. We must let his life be our life. Day by day, we are to grow up into Jesus. Day by day, believe more fully that Christ is at one with me and that I have a perfect life. There comes a crossroad a fork in the way. Jesus has already gone that way. Lord, work in me to will and to do of his good pleasure, of your good pleasure, the right way. Give me, Lord, that perfect life that Jesus has lived on my behalf. So what is the saying right there at the beginning of that paragraph? Circumstances, conditions, problems, Situations will be popping up all the time. And you know how that is. You know how living goes. So at that point, we say, okay, that, that is new to me. I, I'm just seeing it here for the first time. But it's not new to Jesus. Jesus already lived that for me. So all that I have to do is say, okay, yeah, I want what you did in this situation. I want that now. Thank you. Instead of saying, oh, I have to find a way out through this. Yeah, Jesus would have it, but I, I think my way is really good. I mean, this is foolproof. No, <laughs> take what he already did for you. Take what he already did for us and say, yeah, thank you so much. I, that's exactly what I needed. That's how practical. That is how practical it is. It's my life. It is your life. Do you want that life? Do you want to be saved? Do you appreciate? Let me, let me ask. I'm just interjecting this. Do you appreciate the salvation that he gave you already? We just went through uh, Easter. And the world at large, were, at least the Christian world, was thinking and talking and preaching and remembering what Jesus did for us, for us at the cross. 
But what he did for us at the cross is much bigger than what the world is trying to do to Easter, right? It's filling it up with bunny rabbits and little chickens and eggs. Nothing wrong with bunnies and rabbits and eggs. God created those. But when we let those things take over the reality of what Jesus did there, then the enemy is succeeding at veiling it from us, just obscuring it completely from from our sight. We need that not just at Easter. We need that every single day of our lives because that gift is ours. He already gave it to us. What do we do? Do we say, thank you so much. I appreciate it so much. Thank you, thank you, thank you for doing that. Or at that point, we can say, yeah, but I got a better idea. I really don't need that. And then we are rejecting it. But it is a matter of looking at what Jesus did and realizing deeper and deeper and deeper yet that that was for me. That was so that I can have not only eternal life, but a life that is transformed and lived in the same character as Jesus Christ did. The words of John Bunyan in the work of Jesus Christ as an advocate, it says, let's read together. He that understands to believe sets up on the hardest task that ever was proposed to man. Not because the things imposed upon us are unreasonable or unaccountable, but because the heart of man, the more true anything is, the more it sticks and stumbles thereat. And says Christ, because I tell you the truth, you believe me not. Isn't that something? Yes, the enemy tried to tries to close the door and, and, and make us say, oh, no, 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 I don't need that. There's absolutely no, because then that makes me feel and makes me see myself for, I, for who I really am, right? And so, no, no, you don't need that. It's okay. I mean, you have lived all this, this many years making your own decisions. What's wrong with continuing in the same way you were going? Oh, let's not fall for that. Continuing there, hence believing is called laboring, Hebrews 4.11. And it is the sorest labor at times that any man can take in hand because it is assaulted with the greatest oppositions. But believe thou must be the labor never so hard. Friends, there was a man who came to Jesus. He wanted his servant to be healed. And he said, Jesus Just speak the word, and I'll just take you at that word. And Jesus said, according to your faith, may it be unto you. May it also be unto us, is my prayer. Amen. I think we could close going back to page 53. So we can read there the words that describe Jesus and the way that he goes through every situation, not just when we have a a major surgery or uh, something really that that shakes us right right down to our foundations. No, for everything of every day, you know, cooking, uh, freezing things, uh, doing the shopping, whatever, all of it, Jesus has to be that practical, that real to us. So on page 53, We begin there where it says, um, through all our trials, the indented paragraph, right about three quarters of the way, page 53, through all our trials. Everybody there? Okay, let's read together. Through all our trials, we have a never failing helper. He does not leave us alone to struggle with temptation to battle with evil and be finally crushed with burdens and sorrow. Though now he is hidden from mortal sight, the ear of faith can hear his voice saying, fear not, I am with you. I am he that liveth and was dead and behold, I am alive forevermore. Revelation 118. I have endured your sorrows experienced 
your struggles, encountered your temptations. I know your tears. And then at the bottom, it continues again. I know your tears. I have, I also have wept. The griefs that lie too deep to be breathed into any human ear, I know. Think not that you are desolate and forsaken. Though your pain touch no responsive cord in any heart on earth, look unto me and live. The mountains shall depart and the hills be removed, but my, my kindnesses shall not depart from thee, neither shall the covenant of my peace be removed, says the Lord that has mercy on thee. Isaiah 54, 10. Beautiful promises to rely upon. And before we pray together, if you go back again now to page 134, that is the beginning of chapter 11. The title of it is Feeling After God. <clears throat> and on page 146, almost at the very end of the, of the chapter, you will find John 14, 27 on the second to the last paragraph of the chapter. Page 146, second to the last paragraph. Find there the quote marks and it says, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. John 14, 27. So there you have something to work on for the next couple weeks while we go through the, through the chapter. Okay. Very good. Let us kneel then for prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we have heard your voice encouraging us, bringing us closer to you, telling us of all the things that you have prepared to make our life, our situations every day easier and able to bear. Thank you, Lord, for the promise of peace, not a promise that we might have and yet we might not no your promises are for sure so when he says let not your heart be troubled neither let it be afraid it is because there is a foundation there is a trustworthy basis for saying let not your heart be troubled lord we thank you for that life that jesus lived those 33 and a half years that he lived in our flesh and blood, facing temptation and all kinds of circumstances and persecution and enemies and people that wanted to make his life as miserable as they could and all kinds of contradiction, despair and pain and sorrow. Father, thank you. Thank you so much that he was willing to live that life so that we can understand that that's exactly what he did for us. He lived our perfect version of our lives. Father, you have made it so easy that at times it seems so difficult. We have been brought up to think if it is that easy, then watch out for the hook. There's going to be some kind of a compromise. There's going to be something there. Watch out. Don't just believe it as easily as that. Oh, Lord, but not with you. Your word is trustworthy and it never changes. It doesn't even have the shadow of change. Father, help us to believe it. And as we allow you to take more and more and more of our hearts and minds, our times, our schedule, our family, our complete lives, Lord. 
help us that we will also help others to realize the great gift that you have given us in Jesus. We pray in his lovely and holy name. Amen.